What's up, Internet? The uh, GM's tired. He just he just he just needs a break. So uh, you know, session's canceled. He's he's they're taking a nap. So fucking tired, man. Not you, bitch. Oh, I ain't talking about you. You don't get to rest. Someone please run a game of Shadow Dark. No. <laughs> you nice. run it for me. No. Suffer. I actually do want to learn how to play <clears throat> Shadow Dark. It looks pretty good. Probably won't be hard. Yeah. It's mostly it's 5e. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a much simpler game. Yeah, I know. It's like General. 5e with OSR. It's 5e with OSR. Um, like cultural design. Yeah. They'd put it. Anyway, you may notice the voice from beyond is different this time. For I am Hello, indeed lady. not what? Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you I'm sorry, say? I thought you were good. Oh, no. You keep going, keep going. You, you're, doing you, you're doing what good. did you Okay. Well, I am indeed not joined by Isaiah. Matt has returned. It is me, Isaiah. I like a gun now. You like my suave accent? That's not even like <laughs> it's not even like a little that. close to what he sounds like. No, it's not. No, it's what? not. <laughs> Matt, are you drunk? What the f <laughs> What the hell was that? I was trying to do like were a really suave. Were you trying to do Antonio just, Banderas? Like, a little bit. <laughs> what the fuck? I say it does not sound like Antonio Banderas. What the hell are you on about? <laughs> Yeah, 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 I'm just being racist at this point. I, uh, I wasn't going to say that, but I mean, you know, fucking, I don't know, call a spade a spade, I guess. I don't know. Oh. Anyways, Jesus hi. Jesus Christ. Huh? Yes, Matt is has returned for several, you know, a few heart pumping hours. Uh, yeah. Because, you know. He's in the warp. Moon. Uh, what? The moon? Did you say he's in yeah. the moon? Yeah, the warp moon, you know. What? It's the one moon in the warp that the orcs can create. Come on, Josh. I thought you knew 40k lore. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm fucking with you. I have no idea. <laughs> I was going to say, this sounds like horseshit, but also given the way that 40k works, it may not be. It could be horseshit, but it also could not be horseshit. I have no way of knowing. It's just it's just the moon that the orcs made while they got trapped in the, in the warp because they were hungry and wanted cheese. So they're like, ah, oh, moon. That's my headcanon. I'm sticking to it. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, your headcanon has about as much chance as being real as not real, to be honest. Uh, but anyway, no, Isaiah has to go to a wedding, uh, <laughs> which is kind of like the warp, but less off, less awful. And nothing like the warp at all, actually. Anyway, mm. uh, what are we doing? I mean, well, we're sacrificing Matt uh, at the end of this to the old gods, but I didn't tell him that, so that's news. Dick. Yeah, uh, so say, say your goodbyes, <laughs> Matt. Um, mm. But before that, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the, the new Dungeon Master's Guide um, because seren serendipitously uh, the, the day before we recorded, Wizards dropped a new video giving us some information about the 5e24 DMG. Mm hmm. Which uh, is kind of crazy to think about that. This is basically the only information like with the player's handbook. We were getting so much information that it felt like, uh, you know, almost too much. <laughs> At a certain point, you're like, this is a lot of stuff. And like, I don't know if I need all this information. And it's a lot of playtesting and yada, yada. The DMG and Monster Manual, they just went in the complete other direction. And we're like, we're just going to tell you nothing. And you're just going to hope for the best. It's. Yep. It feels a, it's a little strange considering yeah, I, how transparent they were with the one and not at all with the other. Yeah, I mean, uh, for the Dungeon Master's Guide, I don't think there needs to be that much. They have to, like, play test with it. Monsters, though, and the encounter building, like, CR math and all that nonsense. I kind of fucking wish they play tested that because, oh, boy, they might. It fucking sucks. I mean, it's still on the table. It could still happen, but I don't think so. Um, the D and D Beyond, the the Adventure of Uni, they already released a couple of new monsters, and they even put it like in quotes, like you know, subject, you know, subject to change, willing to yeah. change, yeah. Um, but the stat blocks that are in there are pretty decent, like so far, like the Bugbear one kind of, meh. but Holy Wog one's kind of mad. The new Mage stat block, pretty good. They could pretty cool. Still 
there's still room like yeah the room th- there may not necessarily uh, i mean it's hard to say the de- the monster manual comes out in february so like there's room to potentially throw out some playtest stuff and be like what do you think of this uh, uh, probably yeah. at this point if they were to show us anything it would be stuff that's already been through a couple of internal uh, internal passes of playtesting and then we would see like an 80% looked you know like a version that's already been 80% looked over so oh yeah uh, we w- it wouldn't be like the player's handbook but they could show us some stuff but they may not or they may I have really no idea but it, it just feels a little weird that we got so much with the player's handbook and then nothing with the other two books and I assume that that is mostly just because of time and because yeah. they were under a time and pressure crunch to get these books out and yeah. I think if they had more time we would have probably seen different a lot, certain things more like I think things would have gotten a more of a fine tooth comb if they weren't yeah. trying to hit the 2024 release date, even though they yeah. arguably they didn't. missed kind of. Yeah, they kind of missed. Yeah, uh, but I, you know, no, it's, I mean, there's no way well, to they know, have but, they yeah. have five like starting right now as a time of recording. They have five whole fucking months. To work or uh, four and well, a half. They have, work on the dungeon ma- the, on the, the DM, monster manual. Well, monster manual. On the monster well, dungeon manual. master, they're it's probably done. No, dungeon now, master's guy is done. Yeah, dungeon master's it's coming out in no, November. It's it's done. Monster, monster manual, manual. They're still working on tweaking it, fine tuning it. I don't know. They have four months to really like. You got to remember the though. Down. There's a lot of time. We got to go through approval and then send off to the printers yeah, and then yeah, do yeah. test prints. Like, it's not four months. It's not like they can work up to the wire, right? It's probably. Well, I'm just saying. As more far like, as we know, audience wise, they have four months. It's probably Actual more like studio two wise. Yeah, I would, would yeah. be my guess. Maybe three. Like, yeah. I mean, again, doesn't matter. Nothing you could nothing we could do about it at this point. Yeah. But I do feel like there's a world where if they weren't rushing to the 2024 date, we could have gotten a, a little bit more interesting of a product potentially, or maybe not. Hard to say. Apps. Uh, but I think some. I think there's some aspect. There's certain things in the game that I feel like people wanted them to to look at more, and they just kind of didn't. And I feel like some of that is because of a time crunch. Yeah. Like crafting, for example. I think people- it's okay. They're probably don't worry, Josh. It's going to be in the DMG. And by it's going to be in the DMG, I mean they're going to pull the rules from Xanthar's guide and just throw in the new Dungeon Master's guide and call it finished. Uh, I don't think they're going to do that. <laughs> that's no? that's no, I don't think so. I think we are going to get a new set of rules. Are they going to be similar mm. to the Xanathar one? Probably they'll be similar, but I don't think they're just going to throw them in whole cloth. I think that would be a little silly. I just don't see them doing that. It wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past them, but I mean, I'm, I'm willing to see. I'm willing uh, to be like wrong. I I because I, I, I actually like the Xanathar's rules, but I wish they were a little better. Yeah, they need they need work. I I think we're probably going to get a more refined version of those rules would be my thought. I don't think it's just going to be those rules as is. That seems unlikely. Uh, But the uh, before we uh, we continue, Josh, no, no, man, I was going to transition on my own time. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Okay, don't cut me off. Don't cut me off. I know. I remember. No. Shit, now what I forgot what I, the other thing I was going to say is <laughs> fuck. <laughs> ah, damn it. Anyway, yes, stuff like the crafting rules is things that I think people wanted them to look over more and give a little more attention to that they didn't. And that feels like one of those things that suffers a little bit from the rush release date situation. This is, yeah. of course, all in uh, uh, armchair quarterback theorizing here because obviously we have no way of 100% knowing that, but you know. Mm hmm. Anyway, yes, before I was rudely interrupted, what Matt was going to say is you could hit follow or subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening right now. That's what Matt was going to say or have me say when he interrupted me. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Anyway, is so we this- got a video talking about the new Dungeon Master's Guide. I yeah. 
am most interested amongst these three books. I am most mm. interested in this book because I think this one's going to see the most change. Yeah. And I think of all how many complaints people had about the original Dungeon Master's be, Guide. Because most well, of the time people don't don't look at it. <laughs> well, that like, and because the, the developers themselves, Chris Perkins included, looked at the DMG and went, yeah, it was kind of shit. And he has yeah. ba- he basically said in so many words, it was kind of shit because we just didn't have enough time and enough budget to to, to look at it. And yeah, because I think in the original release, it was that and Delver, then the Monster Manual, then the Dungeon Masters. <laughs> like the DMG came out last. Yes. And but somewhere in between there, Horde of the Dragon Queen. But like, yeah. Well, Horde of the Dragon the- Queen, Horde of the Dragon Queen, Cobalt Press made. Well, but it was still like a wizard. Like I'm saying, like in the like the beginnings of twenty back in twenty fourteen, you know, D anD D, the uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide was the last book to come out of the new edition, like yes. free. The monster, uh, the Monster Manual was the second one, and then in between the Player's Handbook and the Monster Manual, Lost Minds of Fandelver, and I believe the the Ry- Rise of Tiamat, like the Horde of the Dragon Queen, the fir- the very first one that the yes, adventure Horde that nobody likes, Queen. yeah. I, I think, well, that the, the fact that it was the last in the list would make you think that it got more time. But based on what the way Perkins and Crawford have talked about it, the DMG got the least time is what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Or at least way less than they wanted to give it. Mm-hmm. And that's why, A, it's poorly organized. Yeah. And definitely. B, the 2014 DMG very much reads like, Oh, you already know what you're doing. You've GM'd before, so here's like a couple little tidbits of information and if you want. Like it yeah, doesn't that is the, it doesn't yeah. read like a teaching tool. It reads like uh you've done this already, so here's some extra like assistance with certain mm-hmm. things. It's not uh it does not read like you haven't DM'd before, so we're gonna show you how. It's very much yeah. not that. No, especially for like a newer GM, because I remember my first time really flipping through the DMG, I skipped the most of the beginning stuff. Because it's all about the DMG like cosmology build the universe and the world and, and yeah. the planes and building like all this shit. I'm just like, I don't want to run. <laughs> yeah, it's very, <laughs> con- it's very confusing. It's like weirdly laid out. I don't- Does it even have a section that's explicitly? Hold on, I'm actually gonna open this up real quick. Okay. See explicitly on what how to run the game. That's that is titled. That's chapter eight. <laughs> After that- treasure. Is it? Re- hold on, no. Yes, sir. I'm Holy looking at it right shit, now. Shit, it is. Yeah. Jesus yeah. Halfway Christ. through the book, they'll teach you how to run the game. Yes, 235 <laughs> pages in running the game. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's weird because running the game, it's like filled with stuff. You're like, okay, you know, t- table rules, rolling yeah, dice. But then yeah. it also has weird stuff like diseases and poisons and madness. And you're like, why is this yes. part of running the game? Well, it is part of running the game, but it's not part shouldn't of... Shouldn't that be in that it's, section? It, it should... Yeah, no, it should be part of running the game as, like, a section B. It's not the main crux of it, right? Like, that's yeah. the weird thing. Like, I like the be- like the, the beginning chapter of the original DMG has some good bits in there, like, the, the first few things where it's, like, the big picture, the core assumptions, blah, 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 and you read some of that, and it's like, all right, that's cool. But that's just all... It's very fluff. like I don't want to say fluff. Yeah, no, it it's is. kind of fluff. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it doesn't sh- tell me how to run the game. It just gives me an overview of like what's it like to be a DM. It's very high like level. What shit. is? Yeah, like more concepts and shit. And then it's like, then the next chapter is like breaking down all the fucking planes of existence. And Which it's like, no new GM gives a single fuck about. No. Or even knows what it means, really. Right. But like again, good stuff. Like the the whole like play style chapter. That's you know there. Are, not chapter. Uh, play style part pretty good. Gears of play that's you know helpful. Yeah, is it though? The, the whole, if you're a new GM, I don't think it is. Uh, you I don't, don't think it is. Well, I think for the beginning part, I don't think it's it, like I don't think it is because you have no concept of what that means. Like it doesn't. Tears of play doesn't mean anything to you until you've well, played explain, the game. It, it explains that's the thing. It's like tears of play. It's like all right. right, so right the first but, few levels are like really small adventures, so I don't have to focus on players fighting dragons yet i don't think that's helpful though because i don't think anybody's even thinking in that i I don't think anyone comes to the game thinking like what's my power level of my characters and stuff i'm pretty sure most people come to the game and just think of like default start in a tavern kill some rats fight like a scary monster right like 
People have like a very basic preconceived notion and the idea of explaining tiers of play to them, I don't think it's just going to be a lot of gobbledygook that they forget later until it becomes relevant and then they maybe mm. look back at, you know, like it, it, it's it's not. If I were, let's put it this way, if I were teaching, like if I were a teacher and I was like, this is my how to GM class, you know, and, and I say this as someone who has actually taught children, you don't you I wouldn't come in with like, so you have your various degrees of play, the tiers of play, and this is how the game feels like. Because you don't have a foundation to build on. So it'd be like if I was teaching someone drawing and I explained all the different drawing techniques and stuff, but I gave them no foundation of how to actually start drawing. You know what I mean? Like hmm. I'm explaining different drawing te te techniques to me and they say, uh, teacher, what what do I draw with? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you to pick up a pencil or pick up charcoal or I didn't, you know what I mean? Like it's not an, it's not a thing. It's not an intro thing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's all very like I said, it's it the 2014 GMG is very much written like you know what you're doing already. So here's just it, it's like the 2014 GMG is written like, hey friend, uh so fourth edition just finished up and 5e just came out and you're transitioning from fourth edition to fifth uh to fifth edition. Here's how you run fifth edition that's different from 4e. Like that's how it reads, you know what I mean? Yeah, like you were all more play. philosophical and stuff in the way like the writing. A lot of big yes, concepts. Yes, stuff, yes, yes. Not which, and the few times where it does go into hard, like not hard facts, but like rules and like how to how to do stuff. Well, it's that, like sparse. That's also a transitioning from fourth E kind of thing, right? Like four E was not like that as much, and five E they're sort of like this is more the vibe we're going for. So again, yeah. it's like oh, you played this version. Here's the new version, but it's not mm -hmm. like you've never picked up D and D a day in your life. The new DMG from all context as far as i can tell is you've never played DD &D a day in your life here's how the game works yeah i mean he did chris perkins did mention like the first chapter is literally just called the, the basics. basics yeah so it's like yeah how to you know if you're thinking about dming or whatever he even says like it's like how to schedule how to like get your players like all this stuff i'm like yeah okay yeah <laughs> yeah uh, it's the, like what if you exact... don't have a gaming group what if you like don't have a lot of friends to play like you know shit like that the exact opening phrase that Perkins uses is that, uh, you know, this is a chance to revisit the DMG, which they admit the, the, the 2014 one's not great. Um, yeah. And that I like the quote the, where it's like, it's indispensable for DMs. Yes, it's like, the ooh, objective ooh. is is for it to be your best friend, for it to be yeah. an indispensable book, which. I mean, with the old DMG, were they like with the 2014, were they thinking that? Probably, but that's not what happened, right? So now yeah. it's like we're really basically they were like this time around we gave ourselves a mantra and really tried to stick to the mantra yeah now Whereas whether wins, they did or not yeah. of course we will see but that's how they're, I, that's what they're saying i really hope they gave chris a, a lot more leeway and control over this because uh, uh yeah like years ago he used so. to run he used to run a dm advice blog and basically all these other DM like because I I follow a lot of people who help you become a better dungeon master, like uh, Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master book or the um, so you want to be a better game master book by the Alexandrite or uh, DM Lair's Secret Art of Game Mastery or actually just recent, literally a few days ago, I just got my Tales of the Valiant Dungeon Master's Guide book and yeah, I'm looking yeah, through yeah. that. So it's like there are so many advice books now and like how to actually and like for just fucking Matt and Matt Colfield's videos and YouTube videos there's so many things out there now of like that how are to better be than the 2014 better, DMG <laughs> yes uh, how to be a good dungeon master how to be a dungeon master how to like learn it and stuff I I'm am, hoping and a lot of people reference Chris Perkins old blog which yeah. was to the coast deleted because yeah, now that shit's gone so I'm hoping that he still had some of those old documents and blogs somewhere on an old computer and was like, hey, I can take a crack of these and update some of these and maybe throw them in my new Dungeon Master book. I mean, yeah, you people were so reference shit. He said, yeah, you and would like, hope yeah. that some of that, if not the words, exactly the thought process, at least made it into the new DMG for sure. You would hope for that. Um, yeah. I, a side note, I am I am curious about the Tales of the Valiant 
and I, I, yeah. I do kind of want to look through it just to see I, how it I compares. Skimmed. Yeah, I, I haven't fully read it front to back. I kind of just skimmed some stuff. So far from the few things I'm seeing, it's about half stuff I've already seen and the other half is like, oh, that's interesting. But I mean, I don't necessarily need it to be uh, super new and unique or anything. I'm just curious about their take on how to structure it and how to do the teaching and stuff. And I I, I want to compare it to the 2024 DMG or yeah. anything to see since they're being made since they were made almost in parallel not quite but pretty close yeah yeah um uh, another big thing that perkins harped on in the video was that the new dmg was restructured to be in a much more intuitive order and based on the way he described the chapters i think we could pretty safely assume that yes it is in a much more intuitive order because yeah. as we were just saying the, f the 5e f uh, 14 dmg very much not in an intuitive order at all <laughs> in a very like, strange right, first we're gonna go over concepts and then the universe like like yeah concepts like, wait, the about? universe and then we're gonna zoom back down how to make an adventure and then how to make an npc in some places and then between the places there's some stuff and then oh after you're done with the adventure though even though we were just talking about between adventures once you're done with adventures you need treasure uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I guess we should tell you how to run the game now. Here's some optional no. rules you want to throw in just f for oh, shit. Four you wanna, reasons. Oh, you want to build monsters? Ah, shit. All right, better get to the Dungeon Master's workshop. Hold up. That doesn't even... Does that even... Uh, oh, that's, that's right. It does, it does have that... It does have <laughs> that weird... The, the Dungeon Master's <laughs> workshop I, is a chapter I actually kind of like, but some of it is quite goofy. I, um, I, I forgot yeah. about the creating monsters section, to be honest. Well, that's the section... Who the fuck yeah. uses that? Uh... I tried uh, when I, I I think in one of the, these episodes, I mentioned uh, the drow. Jesus Christ, the dragon sorcerer drow assassin fucking bad uh -huh, guy uh -huh. I made. How'd I that, tried using the do? rules and it, not and it was it was rough. It was rough going. Yeah, because they're, it. they're not <laughs> they're not easy to read. They're not intuitive, really. Like they're very dense and not clear. <laughs> um. Because I do remember, I didn't even like, I didn't even try to use it, but I do remember like reading through it. Um, okay. So a couple of notable things he brings up in the new book. We're going to have five short adventures, a complete campaign setting, which some people have taken umbrage with that statement, uh, a lore glossary. And of course, he talked about the Bastion's chapter quite a lot. Yeah. Of course. Just on hearing that, what are your like? What are your overall, like, your take on, like, just hearing that, like, all right, we're getting some adventures, we're getting a campaign seven setting, uh, I'm the, the, the lore glossary, like, the lore glossary is going to be cool, I think. Um, they they put one in the Vecna book at the back, and I'm oh, kind of okay. waiting until after the campaign to show you guys, because, okay. like, it is it is pretty cool. Um, like, it's in, you know, they have a little, like, it, it basically just breaks down, like, who is this character? Here's art, and I'm like, oh, so, a whole chapter just on that like they, i think what did he say he's like literally like what is adamantine it's like yes oh yeah like i've never been explained to what is adamantine i've had to look it up myself from yes D, &D wiki or some shit yeah i mean i think similar to yeah it's a, it's a chapter similar it's going to be similar to the rules glossary i mean i think most of the things i would want to be there are in there in terms of the broad chapter sense but there's a couple of minute details that they didn't necessarily mention that i'm like i hope that gets in there uh mm. but i'm hearing mostly good words so far what are some of the few things that you wish we're gonna they get haven't announced to them, yet that could Matt. be we're gonna get to them when we okay. get to their relevant chapter oh, okay jump ahead all right uh, we're getting a bunch more magic item art, which I'm sure will make a lot of people happy. Yeah. I, I don't personally care. Like, it's fine. I'll take it. But I'm not like chomping at the bit for that personally. Um, there's an adventure that specifically is for creating adventures, uh, which does exist in the 2014 book. But Perkins was talking about it like it's they sort of rewrote it to be a little more focused on again a newer gm and also he specifically called out that we they wrote that chapter 
to be about creating adventures for your table, not about publishing adventures. Yeah, I I circled that too in my notes. I was like, creating content for yourself, not published. And it's like, yes. ah, and I'm like, okay. So I think what he's saying is that that chapter is probably going to be less dense and a little more focused on, you know, like how to take notes, how to organize yourself, how to, you know, how to plan for Mm -hmm. weird contingencies because designing an adventure is a very different can of worms, obviously. And most people aren't doing that. So it feels sort of unnecessary to put that in the DMG. And I do think the old DMG chapter kind of was a little bit like, how do you design an adventure if you wanted to make it like a published version? You know, like it does feel it did. It did feel like that a little bit. So like he mentioned, it's going to be an emulated format. So it's like, uh, you know, you can take this adventure, break it down to its simplest form, and then you can use that like, well, yeah, so he said to build he like said the, the five adventures, the, sh- the five short adventures that are in the DMG are intended to be a format that, in his words, the DM will want to emulate. Yeah. So, again, that makes me think that they are not those five short adventures are going to be written different from how full published adventures are. Because he's making it seem like they're almost going to be almost like more broad outlines and less specific adventures. Yeah. In There's such only a f- half a page each. So they're half like- a page and it, and it sounds like they're if I I mean, this is interpretation, but it sounds mm-hmm. like the way he's sort of saying is that we're going to design these adventures as if you were writing notes for your own personal campaign in the book itself, like. We're going to rather than we're going to make adventures that feel like published material, you know, Mm -hmm. which is good because, yeah, yeah, like Uh, as they joke, I mean, they joke about it in the video itself. You know, when you sit down to design your own campaign, you don't have everything meticulously organized and written out note by letter by letter by by sentence. You know, you just have like Mm -hmm. broad notes, major beats, stuff like that. So it sounds like they're going to design it that way. I'm wondering if they're going to take any. Um, adv- did you read up on any of the deck of many thing adventure spreads um, when that book came out? I'm like, I did not. They had a they had a system on how you can randomly draw cards and build an adventure from that. Oh, and, like, oh, they had yes, a whole yes, 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 yes. The card drawing was, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super I interesting. Do that. I, yes, I kind of wonder if they're doing something like like this is the blueprint where it's like. Literally, the adventure right, begins, right, right, then right. the journey, then the entrance, and the uh-huh, three uh-huh. challenges, and then the last room is the guardian with the treasure in it. And it's like, I don't know if th- that's just a blueprint. That's not the blueprint right, I'm assuming right, right. they're working on, but like, that's I a- wonder if one of those is a good example, and they kind of break it down on how that works. You might be onto something, actually, because uh, what's his name? The other dude is in the video, not Perkins, with the gray hair and the glasses. I can't, I'm blanking on his name. Yeah, he's the guy that made the Draconomicon. Matt, help! <laughs> Fuck. Uh, What's his name? Shit! Is it is it James Wyatt? Is that his name? Uh, yeah, James Wyatt. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, James Wyatt. Yeah, he he's been around for a while, and honestly, there's actually a bunch of adventure uh, adventure league adventures that I've right stolen and used in my camp, my homebrew games, and like <laughs> well, <laughs> that he's written and stuff. What I was, he, he's just done everything. He's great. Right. So what I was gonna say is, yeah, he's been around for a while, but he's come to the forefront more recently, and one of the books that he was a big face for and and I believe was a, a sort of head like in charge of was the deck of many things or, or the book of many things. Sorry. So that whole mm-hmm. adventure buildy with the card system, I think, had a lot to do with him, which means, yeah, you're probably right. If they take that system and apply something of a similar style to the DMG, I would say yes that is something that you would want to emulate at your table. So that'd be great. I, I hope, I hope your, I hope your theory there is on track. Cause that, that actually, I wasn't even thinking about that. So now that I'm thinking about it, I'm now more enthused by that potential. Yeah. Or when they mentioned like, it's going to be, you know, uh, a format, like you can, it's going to be how to create adventures and outline adventures with that very skeletal, right. which they used a lot in this book. Uh, yeah, yes. the, uh, there are a lot in the video of the, like a lot of things are skeletal, which 
sometimes I'm worried when they say stuff like that, but we can get into that later. Um, but I definitely that it instantly I thought of the deck of many things is that right. that whole process of how to build adventures just from the cards is so cool. It, and ma it makes I sense. Want to yeah use that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I could very easily see some sort of version of that being in the DMG. I think that could make a lot of sense. And yeah. as far as I'm aware, everybody liked that system. So yeah. um, if they can get one. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we're getting a new um, uh, appendix of maps uh, with quite a few yeah. that are intended to be reused over and over again. This is a fun, fine, fun little thing. I don't know if I'm personally going to use them very much, but, you know, it's a fun little addition. Yeah, I don't think I ever used any of the... Actually, no, I used one map from the Dungeon Master Guide, and I think it was, like, a big, empty, open cave. <laughs> I just, it, like, threw a monster hunt in there or something, right, like right. a boss fight, like an Umber Hulk or some shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're getting the maps. Uh, like I said... As I said before, uh, this version of the DMG seems to be pointed much towards uh, newer DMs, much more than the 2014 version. But Chris Perkins said there is still evergreen material. That was the word he used uh, in this DMG for more seasoned GMs. Yeah. Uh, example being the maps. Yeah. I don't know how true that's going to hold up. 100%. I mean, there's going to be a certain degree of evergreen material. Is it going to be as much as he says? I don't know. We'll see. You know. Mm -hmm. um, this was interesting. So James Wyatt was talking about some of the variation in those five adventures and the types of hooks they have. So the two examples he gave was one is go kill uh, the cursed forest corruption source thing, you know, something, yeah. something Which, in the forest, go kill it. When he when he said that, that re immediately reminded me of the Daggerheart adventure. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yes. Man, that sounds super familiar. It does, actually. It's a good point. <laughs> but then the other ones he mentioned was convincing the fairy baron to, like, let you into the ball and get his blessing. Yeah, yeah. Which I think like, is... Okay, that's Int yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's completely different spectrums of adventure. Right, well, that's the thing that think, I think is interesting. If all five of the adventures are entirely different styles of adventure yeah. that will be really good as a teaching tool because it can show you as a newer GM, like what the different kind of games you can run are, which is good mm -hmm. because, you know, less emphasis, less emphasis on dungeon fucking because that's how most people are playing these days. Anyway, uh, is it? Yeah, I would say for the broad majority, yes, most people are playing. I feel like most we'll, people are playing Critical Role. Most people are not playing. Oh, you know. Sorry, I thought you meant like more people are dungeon crawling. I'm like, no, I no, 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 other way around. No, people are doing less <laughs> yeah, yeah. dungeon fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. are doing more narrative, critical role-y type, you know, shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like that they they mentioned like, oh, we're gonna have a table of different adventure hooks, which you know, I love tables in general. I uh, they're not whether they're needed or not, like in a book like this, because you can just find. A million zillion like random tables of adventure hooks but the fact that they're just gonna throw them in here like well that's fine you can find a million zillion books but i think the difference is that getting a table getting tables for stuff like this from the creators of the game lends some because here's the thing right if you get it from the creators of the game you'll have one of two reactions either you'll look at the table and say oh that was a similar adventure hook to the idea I had. And then you'll feel validated that you're on the right track. You're like, oh, okay, I'm yeah. thinking about this correctly. Or you're going to look at it and go, oh, I might not have thought of that. This is a different avenue that I didn't necessarily think that the game could go in. Yeah. Right? So both of those outcomes, the tables are good. And of course, you can get that to a certain degree from a third party source. But having it come from the uh, from the game itself mm. is a little more reinforcing. You're like, okay. This is the kind of vibe that the designers expect from me. You could tell the designers to go fuck themselves and ignore everything they do, of course. But if you want to know what the designers expect of you, that's a good way to go about it. Yeah. And like throughout some of the mostly like some of the monster books, like uh, especially if you look at the random tables in the Big B's book and Fizz, Fizz, um, both those books have great tables just from adventures like combat encounters, uh, environments, like like all the tables in those, especially those two books are pretty good. There's yeah. some stinkers here and there throughout, like, you know, but like it's been 10 years. There's going to be mean, some stinkers. Yes. But like, yeah. 
I, well, and also it's like, uh, I may never ever, like me personally, I may literally never use those tables. I probably won't. I'm not the kind of person who usually does, but I will look at them and yeah, see what's in the there thing. and go, yeah. okay, this is kind of what you want me to do with this. Now I have an idea. You know? mm-hmm. I, I like to use the tables for inspiration where it's like, if I'm not going to run that, like whatever the hook I roll, I can take the idea and like maybe combine with it, it with two other tables and like make my own adventure or something from that. Yeah. You know? The juice is flowing. The rain juice, the wrinkle. Uh, they then mentioned another uh, comment about the like organization of the book. They were a little all over the place in the video based on how the book is actually ordered. I, which was a little weird, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think there's an old video where Chris went through actually every single chapter and you, you someone can find it. Uh, the very last, so l- the, the very, um, very last chapter of the book, he specifically said is a secret. Oh yes. So I, they, I do they, remember that. I yeah. do remember that. So I'm interested in like what the very last, like right, thing right, is. Right, right. Cause they, they have the, like, you know, how to like the basic shit. Uh, they're going to do the Bastion chapter, the treasure stuff, fucking Greyhawk, like all that jazz. But then it's like the mystery chapter. And it's like, what's in the box? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I forgot. I did forget he said that forever ago. Um, but more importantly, he was. <laughs> they mentioned <laughs> the campaign chapter has shifted further back in the book for obvious reasons. <laughs> Crazy. Like, yeah, it's one of those ones where you're like, oh. I mean, yeah, no, great, weird. You know, it's weird, though, because like when he mentioned the whole like, yeah, we're not expecting most first DMs to like pick up and build an entire campaign. And I'm sitting here and I hear so many of the horror stories and not that my first experience was a horror story, but like so many experience of DMs being like, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. I may I just made a whole campaign world, uh, random fantasy land go and he's just, like, off to the races. Yeah, just well, throwing random <laughs> bullshit in. <laughs> I think what he's saying is we don't expect everyone to make a gray hawk necessarily. Yeah. But I think what people end up doing is they just start throwing a bunch of shit at a wall because they don't know because they have no direction. They just make a mm-hmm. whole bunch of stuff to try and cover yeah. every base because they have no clear direction, Um, which is is technically making a campaign world. But that's not a, I don't think that's exactly what he means when he says that. No, yeah, I agree. I, it was just a, a funny thought. He that, doesn't. Like, when I he think starts. Yeah, yeah Chris does, Chris Burgess doesn't expect you to make a deeply intricate Forgotten Realms type universe on your first go round. I think is what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, the the panicked first time DM throwing shit at a wall campaign world is a you know slightly different vibe. <laughs> mm. Um, speaking of campaign worlds, this is gonna be. The first DMG with a campaign setting built into it ever of all the DMGs that existed and said campaign setting is going to be Greyhawk, which is the first official D&D setting ever published. Yeah. Uh, In other words, it's the world that Gary Gygax made up. (laughs) Yeah. I'm very interested in in this idea because it's like. Because again, Wizards have had a very mixed bag when it comes to campaign settings. They have like. The golden seal of approval when it like Eberron rising for the last ward, like 10 out of 10 fucking great campaign setting books. If you look back in fourth edition, like so many, so many campaign setting books, a lot, and yes. a lot of them probably are pretty too good. many, arguably, yeah, probably too many. Yeah. Um, so if it's half as good, like and again, Eberron, it's a whole fucking book. But if it's at least half as good and well organized as Ember as the Eberron book is, I'll be happy. Like even if it's just uh-huh, a, uh-huh. a slightly copy paste chapter, if they at least format it the same and they kind of break it down the same, I'll be like el- elated. Yeah, I mean, I, we'll we'll see with that particular like the the formatting. Obviously, they're not going to talk about. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What Perkins said, and I think this is going to be a big point of contention. I think some people are going to get a little annoyed because they use the word complete campaign setting and then. Immediately after what Perkins said was he was inspired by the original Greyhawk Gazetteer, which was a pretty small mm-hmm. book at only 32 pages for the entire setting. And he's like half of that was like war shit. And some of that was <laughs> wargaming shit. But he felt like this gave him 
like him personally, when he picked up this book, this Greyhawk as a tear back in the day, Chris yeah. Perkins felt like the sparseness, the st- the information being sparse but useful made him felt like he could make the setting his own. Yeah. They took that inspiration and said, we're going to do a similar thing. So the campaign setting in the 2024 DMG is built in a similar kind of skeleton style mm-hmm. with the intention of the, the, the DM building upon it rather than just reading it and using it whole cloth. Yeah. Some people I think are a little annoyed by that or going to be annoyed by that because the word complete makes it sounds like there's a lot of information in there, but then them saying it's a skeleton of a setting makes it sound like there's not that much information in there. Right. I, to be honest, it's, it's like, if it's only going to be a chapter, it is, I, yeah. I'm expecting like spark notes and that's fine yes. because like, you know, Hey, like internet, there's 50 fucking years of Greyhawk nonsense out there. <laughs> it's very, so dumb, easy to find. You'll be fine. You like look at all the people complaining about, you know, 5e Spelljammer. Look what all they are doing. They're going back into the second edition and buying up all the PDFs and the books and shit and reading those and taking stuff out and Lord, like learning about that. People are going to do that. People, hell, probably people are going on the DMs Guild now and going to buy that Gazetteer that Chris Perkins mentioned. Almost certainly, yes. So, like, if, if you want it, like, this is just a Spark Notes. Like, this is going to be like, you can take it and run with it. If you want more information, it's out there. You can find it. It's very easy. If you don't need it and you want to homebrew it and change it and make, again, this is your Greyhawk now. You can do that, too. You know? I, I think I, that's the goal. I think that that's that's fine. Like, that, I don't need a full book if they're going to do like an exam, especially an example campaign. I personally you know? am completely on Team Perkins here. Because I have played a couple tabletop games that have quite dense settings. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them yeah. being Blades in the Dark, for example. And oh, yeah. Or Cyberpunk. I haven't played Cyberpunk Red, but Cyberpunk Red, another example of a very dense setting. And yeah. I find that most of the time, people do not come to role playing games with the intention of reading a very dense setting. Most of the time, they're not that interested in it. No. And I think giving a skeleton to which you can build upon is going to be way more effective in getting people interested by leaving those gaps than trying to give people every little possible detail. Don't think every little possible detail is actually that useful. And I've been largely okay. I... uh, I should clarify so I don't... Because it's going to sound like I'm being hypocritical here for a second. Yeah. I don't like and or I should say I don't care for setting books as supplements. I don't really give a shit about like Van Richten's. I wasn't like chomping at the bit or um, uh, freaking what was the Magic the Gathering one that isn't Theros? Oh, Guildmasters. Guildmasters. Yeah, Ravnica. Like I don't I'm not super invested in campaign setting supplements in general. Mm -hmm. but I am okay. I don't, when I do look into them, I prefer the sort of sparse general. Here's the main things. Here's a little bit of like, maybe like a timeline or this or that stuff like that. That's what I want because I don't come to tabletop games. Most of the time looking for like any sort of deep, super interest, like crazy, like, uh, I just don't want to have to read a Encyclopedia Britannica to run the game. Every once in a while, you will run into a game. And if Isaiah was here, I'm sure he would agree with this. Every once in a while, you'll read a game and you get really into the setting material stuff. So like Isaiah didn't think he was going to use Lancer's default setting, but then he read a bunch of it and he liked a lot and got really invested. And now he is using Lancer's default setting. That will happen from time to time. But I don't think you can bank on that most of the time. So I think it's a much safer bet to go with the skeleton structure personally. Yeah. If it were up, if it were me, I have a rather, I don't know. Maybe this is, maybe this would be seen as a little strange. If I were making a role playing game, I wouldn't have any setting 
stuff. I would have no setting book. I wouldn't have a setting chapter. I would have the game, and there would be little bits, little tidbits of information throughout the game that hints at little bits of setting. And then I would release adventures, and those adventures would be how you got the setting information by playing through mm. stuff. Kind of right. the the almost like a Dark Souls s mentality of you get the lore by like interacting with the stuff. That's what mm, okay. I would do. So like, yeah, that could be cool. Now that might come across as a little strange because people will be like, what if things conflict or you have gaps and stuff? That stuff's all interesting because again, going back to Dark Souls the contradictions and the gaps and the mysteries and all that stuff is what people is why people get really invested in the dark souls lore stuff because all that there's all that room there's theory crafting and there's the there's room for you as an individual to be like well i think x y and z like you can make your own concept of it Mm. so all that to come back around this idea of having the Greyhawk setting within the dmg have space I think is good for that reason. And another reason I think it's good is because if you're trying to attract new GMs, which they clearly are. Yeah. Having a section of a pre-built, like you're attracting, right? You're trying to imagine the GM. Okay. What world am I going to run this game in? Oh, there's a setting in this book. Okay. Flips to it. Oh, it's only a couple of pages. Oh, I can read that. You know? Like yeah. that making that barrier to entry much lower is much more likely to make them be like, OK, I'm intrigued by this because it's not I don't have to read 300 pages of lore before I can run yeah. the game. Mm-hmm. And so, especially since not only with their, you know, what they're doing with this, they're giving you the whole setting, but they're giving you the main like city as a hub world, which is also, which is yes, the city. Yes, super you're getting a map for of, new DMs. Yeah, you're getting yeah. a map of Greyhawk and a map of the city of Greyhawk, which is like. Yeah, that's going to be a big, big deal for sure. I think that city map is going to be like worth its weight in gold for a lot of people. Yeah, because they did such a good job with the Waterdeep Gazetteer and the Baldur's Gate Gazetteer when those books came out. I like like the the Greyhawk one's going to be fan- fantastic. I mean, yeah, I, I would think so. I don't see I I see that part being I see the the the, the city and the information on the city being particularly a good bit. Uh, But I think some, but I do think, like like I said, tie it all together. There are going to be some people online who are like, oh, Wizards of the Coast being lazy again and making us do the writing for them. People are going to be saying that, I'm sure. Like, I know because I was one of those people saying that, but I was only, I was specifically saying it for one book. Everything else, though, like, I don't, which one do you think I'm going to say? Oh, Strixhaven? Yeah. Well, adventures are... Di- I, I consider adventures to be a little bit different. I think right, that's that's why I only harp on the one adventure. Yeah. Like, you know, if it's like a setting book... Like, again, like one of the things I keep going back with the Eberron book, it's Spark Notes Eberron. Yes. It's so fucking good it, 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 for getting new people into Eberron. There's so much shit. I've, I've been, like, trying to, like, do outside research on Eberron and There's motherfucking Keith, Keith Baker... Does not stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I think now this year he literally said he's stopping writing Eberron stuff. Right, so right. I have like 20 fucking years <laughs> of shit to go through before I run my Eberron game. Right, right. Um, But that's what you want, especially, again, with the Greyhawk. If it's one chapter, it's even better. Um, Yeah, with the uh, with adventures, with the skeleton thing, it could be hit or miss. When it's going to be like these, like the five adventures, let's say, they're short. But if it's like a whole campaign, like, or a whole, like, you know, module, let's say, like, there's got to be a happy medium between Storm King's Thunder and being so fucking detailed, I, like, can't, I can't turn, look a corner without running into an encounter. And then Strixhaven on the other side that ha- that is beyond a skeleton and, and, like, there's nothing here to work with. Like, there's got to be some happy middle somewhere (laughs) yeah well the thing about an adventure specifically as opposed to a campaign setting Mm. is that an adventure is is you looking to the designers for a tailored experience whereas a campaign setting is 
advent, uh, you know, designers, give me something to work with, but I also want to make it my own, right? It's kind of the difference between like reading a book and playing a story based video game. Playing both of in both cases, you know, you want the story, but reading a book, you're saying, all right, author, just, you know, take me on the journey. Playing a story based video game, you're like, yes, take me on the journey, but I would like some agency on the journey. Yeah. I look at adventures as more of like a book situation where you're expecting to be taken on the journey and ex- expecting to do as little work up front as possible because that's essentially what you're paying for. You know what right. I mean? So you being hey. annoyed that Strixhaven feels weirdly sparse, I can understand. Now, were they maybe experimenting and like trying an idea out with Strixhaven? Uh, perhaps. Whether you personally liked it or not, you know, it may that it may have just been like, what if we did this? So, you know. Yeah. But yes, I can understand. There, I do think there is a difference between adventure and campaign setting. I think it, that that is a worthy distinction. I don't know that everyone's going to realize that distinction, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, yeah, I'm. I, <laughs> mark my words, no, if you will. Put money on it. Uh, in the future, when the book comes out, there's going to be a lot of Internet discourse, whether the Greyhawk campaign setting included in the book is good or bad or worth it or whatever. There's going to be a lot of argument. I can't believe they didn't reference this one very specific thing that was right. only mentioned in this right. chapter back they in 1979. They didn't mention <laughs> back in 1975, Brimbo Scrimbolo's Ballsack Extraordinaire. How could you leave that out? It is vital. He sucks off the king in the third era. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. Uh... Speaking of lore stuff, then they talk about the lore glossary, which is an alphabetical list of famous places and characters uh, intended to be used mostly similar to the rules glossary in the 2024 P- uh, player's handbook. That's fine. Uh, I'm into it. Yep, I'm down. Um, they also said it gives you some information from sort of across uh, the years. So mm-hmm. or across the editions, I should say. Um, so they mentioned yeah. there's lore. There's an entry on the Raven Queen, who is a big deal in Fori. There's an entry on a Sarerak, who comes from first edition. Obviously, a also been in fifth edition, but you know. Yeah. I wonder if they'll mention the spell plague at all, or like some of the edition change. Like, I each edition yeah, normally yeah, when yeah. they change, it was because of a cataclysmic like event. So, uh, I would think so. I feel like they'll probably reference it a little bit. I'd be surprised. Well, uh, no, I mean, if they're talking about information from across editions, I feel like it's got to come up a little bit. Um, yeah, I would think like, so. if the fact that they're mentioning the Raven, like that one surprised me. The Raven Queen. Yeah. Yeah. Because of how much they de-emphasized her in fifth edition. But it did because of critical role, like they kind of not brought her like back into like relevancy, but like they gave her a little bit of a chunk in uh, in the Tome of Foes book. Right, right. And they kind of more emphasized her in there. And then, like, again, Hexblade was originally going to be the Raven Queen Warlock. Right, right. And then they changed it to, you know, shadow magic item thing. <laughs> Sword Warlock. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they felt like she was cool enough to include, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not complaining about it. That's pretty cool. And then again, it is good for newer. If it is for newer DMs, like because again, like uh, I, you know, I mentioned on podcast, like the first time I learned about Morton Cannon was when Tome of Foes came out, and then right, I started right. looking up shit, and then I'm like, okay, I want to use this guy as an NPC in my game, so rather than me having to look up shit. If it's in the new Dungeon Master's Guide, a new player can be like, ooh, Morton Cannon, I want to use him as an NPC, or ooh, Tasha, I want right, to use right. her, you know. I mean, you'll still have to do some looking up because I'm sure it's not going to be super thick entries, but no, no, but it's like enough to get the, you like, going like a paragraph like and I'm like, OK, I can I can work with it. Then we get on to one of the big doozies, one of the big chapters, the big chunk of redos, the Bastion mm. system. Mm. Uh, so, so we saw the Bastions a little bit uh, in the playtest. Perkins said, yes, we have revisited and tweaked the Bastions since the playtest. I'm hoping they gave them a good chunk of love because while I did like what we were starting with in the playtest, it did feel very start of an idea type stuff. It felt very preliminary. 
Yeah, um, I'm not going to lie because I, I kind of read through and I like a lot of like the, the ideas and like some of the things you get and like that players can do. But man, I look at this and I'm like, dang, strongholds and followers were way easier. <laughs> <laughs> easier? <laughs> easier. Easier? I'm surprised Way easier that. to run. Way, yeah, the strongholds and followers rules are way easier to run. And because I'm going to be doing an Eberron campaign, um, one of the things that was big in it were it's called salvage rules, which was you build a base and you get collect salvage and you use that to gain money. And that's kind of what the Bastion rules turned into or this like the Bastion rules came from originally, I think. Because there's a couple of things in here that I'm like, ah, I recognize that from the Eberron thing. Um, Could be. But even those rules were like, Dumb easier than this. Like some of these bastion rules, I'm like sitting here like I'm like, bro, my brain is dying reading half of this. Like, I just want to run it. How does it work? Matt, are you sure <laughs> you're not just bad at reading? No. Sure. No, I mean I it's cool, but it's a lot. It's a lot of rules. It's a lot of going through this. Whereas again, other material that I've read has just been like, here's how it works. It works. And I'm like, here are the effects. And I'm like, all right, sick, simple, done. Well, also, I remember when this came out and like, like YouTube and Reddit, like after the first day, no one was talking about it. Which is crazy because I figured like people would be excited because it's like, oh, finally, wizards are doing the stronghold rules. Finally, it's the thing that people have been wanting from the Kane company making Dungeons and Dragons and then nothing. So I'm wondering if like, I'm not the only one who looked at all these and I'm like, oh shit, what the? Um, no, I don't, I mean, I mean, it could, I mean, it or could, if even it this could is something that. people want. I, oh, I think people do want it. Um, I just wonder if people perhaps did not get that invested yet because they knew it was play test and it was preliminary and they knew that things were going to get messed around with. So they didn't, necessarily because it's kind of because the thing about the bastion system that's a little different from the other playtest materials is the, if you were to add it in you know it, especially like mid game it's kind of a big it's a big thing to add in like it's a big chunk of shit you know yeah well you meant to add it in at level five so it's right like you right are, but but it, but it's yeah. new rules it, adding mm -hmm. it in at level five is different when you're already expecting it and it's part of the rules incorporated. When this playtest came out, people could have just started campaigns. People could have been really close to the end of campaigns. People could have been right in the middle. And this is a big right. thing that could potentially upend the game. So people probably didn't playtest it very much. Probably most mm. people just read through it and were like, all right, interesting. And then we'll see where it goes. You know, okay. it's, yeah. whereas the other playtest rules were stuff that just moved around like class abilities or affected like spells and stuff stuff that's easier to integrate into a game that you already have going on before the place has started yeah but that's i mean that's me theorizing i don't know mm -hmm. i do think people want it though i don't think it's a thing that people don't want i'd be surprised by that yeah i also remember a while ago when we originally thought that this was going to be in the player's handbook and it's like what the fuck like i'm so <laughs> i mean i didn't think like i think for what i think forever ago we are uh, I, I don't know if maybe maybe me and Isaiah thought it was going to like because they it was coming out all during the play test. It was coming so we out. Like, yes, but we're I like no way they're putting this in the fucking like player's handbook. Like what? Didn't it mention in the player's handbook that it wouldn't be? No, no, they didn't mention anything about it. Yes, it does. It's not... the opening. It... This play test document presents material designed for the 2024 versions of the core rules. The materials here use the rules in 2014, except where noted. Well, the public playtest for the player's handbook continues, we want to give you this early taste of material slated for the revised DMG. Oh, so maybe we just didn't read it. Yeah, y'all just didn't read. <laughs> That's the no. first paragraph at the very top. So yes, they did say that. Uh, second, second. Okay, second paragraph. Yeah, That's right. Point being, <laughs> yes, they said it was for the DMG. Okay. I, I also wouldn't assume something like that would be in the player's handbook anyway, though. It feels a little weird to put in the player's handbook. No, well, although I guess you could argue it's a player fit. I don't know. I could see it. Ar well, it could, I could see it be that's in either I, book. That's why I kind of thought they were going to shoehorn it into the player's handbook because it is a player facing thing. I could see either. Like, or. I was like, man, I'm like, that's like, that's going to be a lot for players. <laughs> I mean, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be that much, actually, but we'll see with the final version. Uh, the, the, the the new shit with the like the player's handbook so far is already a, a, a couple of people have been like, man, this is a lot of a lot of new such, shit. And I'm like, as? is it? I guess just making the characters now like a lot of people are like managing. It's like, all right, so how many languages do I get? And then it's like, all right, wait, my abilities come from my background now. And then it's like, oh, wait, and then, and then I have to choose. A yeah, feat, but how much of that? I have to, how many how, abilities do I get? Yeah. How much of that is it's a lot of information or and how much of that is I'm just used to the old way. And now I'm my brain hurts because it's di- new and different, you know, uh, uh, a mix of both. I think a lot of that is just I, we've been doing it the same way for so long. So now that it's different, I'm confused. Mm. I really think that's all it is. I don't think it's actually that. I mean, there are a couple more choices in the new uh, character creation rules. I do no, want to see. Is like, there, hold on. No, there isn't even. No, there literally isn't actually. Never mind. There isn't new choices. I think, I think it's the options and the choices. I there think isn't that's more. There's a lot. The same amount. Well, no, because in the weapon options, you have to pick. You have to no, pick you, you don't pick those. I mean, you don't pick those. They're tied to the weapon. Pick your weapon. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You pick what weapon you want, and then there you go. Weapon option. But but the but the picking the of the weapon is the exact same thing you did before. You have to pick a weapon. Yeah, most people now are probably going to be looking at weapon option, being like, oh, like what, which one do I want? No, I don't think that's true. Okay. I think most people are going to do what they. I, most new players. My sources I made. Look- <laughs> well, no, I think I think a new player is going to go. All right, what weapon do I choose? I choose this weapon. Okay, and then they're going to see. Oh, it comes with an ability. Okay. Like, I don't think new players are going to be like min maxing what weapon to pick based on what me- weapon mastery is attached to it. You cha- you choose a weapon. You did that before. You choose a background. You did that before. You choose your class. You did that before. You choose your species. Like, I don't think any of the I don't think there's more choices being made. I just think every individual choice affects a couple more things than it maybe did before. Like, obviously, backgrounds give you a feat, but you don't have to choose. The background just gives you a feat. You just pick the background, which you were already doing before. And before, instead of a feat, you got a background feature. So in terms of like information, it is the same amount. It's the same choices, same amount of choices being made. I don't believe so. (laughs) What do you mean you don't believe so? Because I'm reading it. It's like, no, there's more. It's more options. No, it's not. It may seem like, yeah, it is. No, it's not. Think about it, Matt. Before you picked it back. I'm looking at the fucking book. (laughs) No, I know. But think about it. (laughs) Think about how the old book worked, how the new book works. Before you picked a background. And it came with a rider that was the background feature. Now you pick a background and it comes with a rider that is the feet attached to it. That's it. That's the same amount of choices being made. You pick the background. It's the same number of choices before you picked a weapon. Now you pick a weapon and there's a thing that comes with the weapon, but you're not choosing the thing that comes with the weapon. You're just picking the weapon, which is the same amount of choices as before. At level one, you pick a class and you pick a species. That's exactly the same. Like, there isn't more choices. It's the same number of choices. Oh, I kind of want to watch a video of, like, new people, like, using but do, the book. But do you I, get what I'm saying, though? Like... I, I get it. I just disagree. <laughs> but but you can't... No, it's not a, it's not an opinion. I'm stating a fact. Well, no, because it is definitely an opinion, because I'm, I'm, I'm literally looking no, no, at no, the no, chapter no, no, and no, looking no. at the book, and no, it's no, like... No, 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 no. I'm stating a fact. It is the same number of choices. That is just a fact. That's not an opinion. Like the choices, no, I, th- you... I think there's more options. I think that is no, there isn't. More That's what I'm, I'm looking at it. Yeah, there factually at... isn't. That's what I'm telling you. There is not. It's not more choices being made. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not. Like it's... I'm... <laughs> what? How, what I'm do you literally mean? Literally how? Looking... Think, okay. Yeah, I'm, li- I'm literally looking at what it. What were it's the like... choice? Okay, think. Go through in your head for a second. What were the choices that were made in 2014? Pick a species. Okay. Roll for stats or pick your stats. Okay. Pick a class. For some of the classes, you had to pick a subclass, which you don't have to do anymore, so that option's actually removed. Pick a class. Okay. Pick equipment for the class. Uh Uh-huh. Pick a background. Okay. 2024, you do all of the exact same selections. You pick your species. You figure out your stats. Pick a class. Not necessarily in that order. Figure out your equipment, pick a background. All the same choices. And then if you're a spellcaster, you have to figure out spells. Yeah, but there are more options in those choices. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, 
pick your background. It's like, all right, what equipment do I pick? Because each each background comes with multiple things of equipment you can pick. But they all already right, what did spell that. Spell do I pick with a you know a new spell? That's not new. Class picks a new spell. And they give you different spell options. Which one do I pick? Like I'm that's saying, that's not like, character creation. What do you mean? You don't pick subclasses at level one. Oh, I'd level. Okay, I guess it. We're talking about character creation. I fucking guess. We're talking about character creation. I don't know. Most people don't fucking play at level. Who plays at level one? Anyway? <laughs> but that's what we're talking about. We're talking yeah. about character creation at level one. That's what we're that's what we're talking about here. And I was just playing the character creation in general, but yeah. Well, that that's not the same thing though. We're for talking about the new player experience coming in as a fresh player playing a level one character. That's what we're talking about. Mm, okay. There is not more options there. I'm pretty sure there's also less backgrounds. I mean, I'm literally going to I'm literally going to check this right now. Because I'm fairly certain there's actually a, a smaller number of backgrounds. Of course, now I have to find in the old players. But uh, OK, let's see. Racist class equipment customized. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, backgrounds. All right, hold on. Oh, oh no. What page am I on? The wrong page. There's 16 in the new book. 16? Yeah. 16 Four, backgrounds five. in the new book. And 16 in the new book. That's not that number sounded high. Cool. Oh, is there not a... T are they not listed out on a table in the old book? Oh, no. God damn it. <laughs> okay, we could solve... Why would they make things easy? <laughs> we could solve this problem very quickly by consulting the dark notes, if you will. Yeah. Uh, background, background, backgrounds, 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 filter on everything. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, I guess, custom backgrounds. Custom background doesn't count. Okay. That's also so, in both. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one. Fifteen. Okay. Nope, nope, 14, sorry. Okay, so there's technically so two, two more. more in the new book. Okay, I, are we going to consider two more as a substantially greater number? It's so many options. <laughs> and then they also, if I'm remembering correctly with the new classes, they simplified your equipment choices. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that one, that's fine. So you have less of a choice there. You have roughly the same choice of backgrounds. You have identical choice for class. You have slightly more choice for species in that there's what two more species in the new well, it's two handbook. more species and then it's weird because like but the dwarf it's like all right dwarves they only have one species of dwarf you're like okay yes and then goliath they gave like yes well, some of the species you giant. have to make subspecies options yeah and it's like okay but it's like jeez that's really not that much more like I, none of this sounds like some like it's not like they added like five like five more pages of homework or anything here like none of I'm this i'm just saying it's it's a little more out i'm not saying it's like astronomically oh god it's right, crippling like at, choice as like, i'm proving you know, here it's not paralysis. a little more options though it's not gosh there's two whole new backgrounds ah, two whole new backgrounds <laughs> oh two whole new backgrounds <laughs> listen matt math is math and you cannot argue with the math i'm presenting you there's so many more feats now in this book than there were in the there last one like god oh, there's so many options you mean there is no, there's so there many isn't. more feats. Yeah, also, the origin again, the origin feats are tied into the backgrounds. You don't pick them. You just pick your background, which again was the same as before. Which side note, man, I hate that. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. We're not going down that rabbit hole, right? And we're already in this rabbit hole. So <laughs> I'm trying to hop us out. <laughs> <laughs> My point stands. Anyone who's saying I have to make more decisions to make a character is wrong. Hmm. You are incorrect by the mm. numbers. Mm. I, I mean, I, I guess you are new right. Background. I guess you are right on the <laughs> slightest technicality. The also, slightest are, technicality. Two more species no, and two are, more backgrounds. There are definitely way more feats in the newer book than there are in the old book. But one. you don't pick those at character creation. You don't pick those. There's well, also you pick the background that you, you pick the background want. which is tied to the feet, which yeah. you are already picking a background which before was tied to a, a background feature. It's basically the same amount of information. It's the same amount of decision making. How it feels. Also, 
The only reason that there's substantially more feats in the new player's handbook is because the epic boons are in the new player's handbook, whereas before they were in the DMG. If you took out the epic boons, it'd be about the same amount. I say they also had a couple from Tasha's, uh, a couple from Xanthar's. A few, yeah, but not a lot. Not like they made the fighting styles feats now. Well, you don't pick those either. Well, you pick when you get the fighting style ability, but you don't pick the fighting hey. style as a separate feat. So again, not that different. So again, not that many more choices. Almost none. What the fuck even got us here? <laughs> How did we even get here? I don't know. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, Bastion. <laughs> I know we were talking about Bastions. Where's... I'm so lost in the sauce. Okay, Bastions. <laughs> Uh, Chr Chrissy P uh, mm. mentioned that um, they do say in the Bastions chapter, which is good that they say this because I was a little worried about this, that not all types of campaigns will always work with Bastions. Like certain campaigns, if you're playing a Lord of the Rings game, you're not going to have a Bastion. It doesn't really make sense to have one. You know, if your quest is to go right. from one end of the earth to the other and you never come back to the same place. Yes, of course. Doesn't make sense to have Bastions. I'm just yeah. glad they're putting that in that chapter because I was a little worried that they weren't going to mention that. And I feel like then people are going to feel obligated. And like, yeah, it doesn't always make sense. Mm. I'm wondering if they you can make a movable Bastion like an airship or a pirate ship or some shit. Uh, I would be I would say they they might not necessarily have rules for that in there, but I have a feeling that it will not be hard to do that. Yeah, that would be my guess. Um. Like, I don't think there's going to be anything that would stop you from it. You make some house moving castle nonsense. Yeah, with the I could definitely see that. <laughs> um, Bastions uh, still start at level five like they did the play test. Um, the play test said you just get a Bastion at level five. I'm hoping they add a little bit more of a description to that because saying that like you get a Bastion makes it sound like a fucking castle just drops on your head when you hit level five, which is, yeah. you know, so I'm hoping that a little bit more. Not that. I mean, again, I as a seasoned DM would not do that anyway, but I just yeah, hope they add a little it, clarification. Like, yeah, a dungeon that needs to be cleared out or whatever. Or yeah, how, a reward. Uh, dungeon, like, yeah, like give a, a couple example ways of how a players could obtain a Bastion. Yeah. Um, you know, for like the Ebron one, one of them is like a empty warforged colossus yeah you really happen sick. upon some ruins yeah. you clear a dungeon the king you know gives you a gift all that shit yeah uh so the bastion turns which are you know essentially if you've played any kind of like assassin's creed used to have this where you sent assassins out on like missions that's what the bastion mm -hmm. turns are you have the bastion do something for you it, you know the people who work there go on on a mission etc etc uh you could do those outside of game or during a session as like a little aside, either or. Um, and the Bastions, basically the Bastion turn, you can acquire items that you might not be able to otherwise easily get. Uh, the example Chris Perkins mentioned is like poisons and herbs from a guardian, from a guardian, from a garden in your Bastion. So like, ah, oh, I'm going to harvest this deadly flower to make a poison to kill the king at the you know dinner party or whatever. I'll do a Bastion yeah. turn to acquire said poison. Hmm. I'm surprised they never did a monster one. Or is that in the harvest rules? What do you mean? The poisons, because I know they, they mentioned that, but like I wonder if there was a monster. Like if I if I kill a dragon, like can I like use a Bastion turn to like harvest its like scales or whatever? Uh I don't think they said anything about that probably not but maybe yeah because i know that i remember the, the harvesting poison rule like i was like oh maybe they had that was not in the play test as far as i'm aware no um uh, but yeah maybe hmm um, but, but you can combine uh, if you want, you can combine your party's bastions into one giant bastion if that's what you'd rather do, obviously. Um, and uh, which I feel like most people are gonna do the one uber bastion. I feel like multiple, I don't know, I feel, I feel like less people are gonna do the multiple bastions one. 
Yeah. More people are going to want to have Troll Skull Manor. <laughs> I feel like. Um, or not Troll Skull. What's what's it, what's the what do they get in ever in uh, Critical Role? Uh, Gray Skull Manor. Gray Skull Manor. Yes. Oh, you're right. Yeah, something like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the He Man Castle. <laughs> yes, the He Man Castle. Um. And then uh, Mr. James Wyatt, once again, being the voice of the, the voice of knowledge here, uh, makes a little comment about how Bastions can sort of quote unquote op- up the emotional stakes uh, by giving the players, you know, a location where you're rooted and like invested in. You know, there's there's NPCs in your Bastion that you care about. It's a location that you care about. You have your stuff there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think this particular tidbit, even though it's not a mechanical thing, I feel like this idea of the Bastions giving you like an emotional investment in a specific area with NPCs and stuff like that is going to be the aspect of this mechanic that has the most influence on a lot of people's campaigns. Like I, I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of players who maybe don't give a shit about their house like they're not going to mm-hmm. care that their bastion can like get them 1d4 potions a day or whatever but they are going to care that their favorite maid gertrude lives in said bastion so if the dragons attack the bastion they're going to get really pissed you know what i mean yeah, yeah. i think there's going to be a lot of players like that so i think it I, I have a feeling it's going to be kind of like a uh whether intended or unintended i don't know but like it's going to be like a side effect of this bastion system mm. which i think is funny because mm-hmm. again Critical Role, Grayskull Manor, like that whole vibe, right? Yeah. They get attacked, they get all like mad, they had all their guards and shit, you know. There's all that, that whole vibe I think is gonna make, pe- if nothing else, that one part of it is gonna make people want to use this. Yeah. I love the, uh, where's the one? The Guild Hall. You don't get it till level 17, which sucks, but like, yeah. it's is, it is super cool. I mean, I, I did literally this exact thing in my previous campaign. But it was a pizza shop. Uh, well, it wasn't originally a pizza shop, but my players <laughs> made it into a pizza shop. Yes. Um, but like, yeah, I gave them a building. I gave them a home base. I gave them neighbors. I gave them like characters that hung around, like all that shit. So mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's an easy way to get players to like give a shit because, you know, the murder hobo memes, right? Like if your players have nothing rooting them to the location, they can murder hobo all they want. And, you know, they don't feel like emotionally they don't give a shit if they like kill everyone on the street because they're like man it's just some place we're visiting yeah but if they live there different story Mm -hmm. also they're not murder hobos anymore if they have a bastion because they're murder homeowners murder homeowners right of course um and then perkins also talked a little bit about how you can use the bastion system as like a little out of game activity by doing a bastion turn to like you know nudge some things forward or help your players acquire stuff. I don't, I don't know how much people are actually going to do that, but you know, it's a fun little tidbit. I, I, I don't know. I don't know about you. I feel like in my games, I've never seen anybody ever do something like that, where they use this in game mechanic as like an out of game activity to do in the meantime between sessions, you know? Yeah, maybe I, like, have you ever seen, have you seen anyone do that or had anyone do that in your games? Where they were like, um, they were like, oh, you know, uh, we can't make a session. So let's just do let's just do this little tidbit, like part of the game or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, I don't think it's like the example. Perkins, like, or mostly they would turn into like a shopping session or something. Instead. Right. The shopping session, I suppose. Well, because like the example Perkins gives is, oh, if somebody can't make it to the game, you could just have everybody do a bastion turn because you can't run the full, you know, you can't run session. So you just have everyone yeah. do a bastion turn. And I'm like, I, I could. Sure. I, could I don't know that anyone's see. actually going to do it, though. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. And then like. The second half of the can the session could be like all right let's just okay we'll just go on with the adventure i mean maybe like he made it could it. be like a time time not time waster but like a time filler thing because they're like oh i really want this other player to be here 
oh, let's just do a Bastion turn, guys. And it's like, okay, Bastion turn's done. Two hours go by, and it's like, oh, we only have an hour of game time left. All right, all right, you guys are traveling in. Oh, shit, fucking goblins. And then I, He made it sound like there's going to be no session at all. You're just going to do a Bastion turn thing. To me, I, I don't fucking know. I, I, that seems unlikely to me. That's all I'm saying. I guess it depends on which Bastion thing. Sure, doing. yeah. Like, if you, like... Because, like, there was a one episode of Critical Role, uh... It's the, the very infamous one, where right before they went to the Briarwoods, and they're all just, like, prepping. Uh -huh. yeah. It could just be a session like that, where they're just doing Bastion turns and RPing and prepping and shit. Sure, yeah, that's true. I suppose. But... Yeah, yeah that's uh, true. I, again, that's just... That's, like, a rare example, because, like, how, how often is that gonna... That's what I mean. Like, how often do they actually do? Yeah. All right. So the treasure chapter. <laughs> I'm a little. I'm a. I'm a doing me a concern on this one. Hmm. The no. magic fashions or the next thing. Oh, no, magic. magic. I just oh. said the treasure chapter. Matt, are you even listening to me? Nope. Oh. Right now, you actually cut out at the. I thought you were still like going to say something with the bastion rules. I'm like, I was like, oh, I thought you were. You're kind of okay. The treasure chapter. <laughs> you hear me that time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they said they looked over every magic item. Uh, they color me slightly skeptic on that one, but they said they looked through every, every magic item. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they added more common magic items, as well as they added all of the 80s cartoon characters, magic items to the DMG. Uh, those magic items do actually already exist on D and D Beyond. They released a little adventure or free, or free, uh, the quest to save Uni the Unicorn or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, that have has... you ever seen any episodes of the eighties? I have cartoon? not. I, I have considered going back and hey, watching them just D &D, for funsies. I think it was on like an April Fool's. They did a whole like twenty-four hour Twitch marathon where they just they did, yeah. replay it, and I kind of watched like a couple episodes that way, and I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, it's very, very old school 80s, 80s Saturday morning cartoon nonsense. Yeah. And I'm like, OK. Yeah. Um, but yes, they. Uh, they um, yes, so they, they put all those characters, magic items, which you can go look at right now if you would like on D&D Beyond. Uh, he also mentioned they expanded some magic items. Um such as the example he gave was the flame tongue being able to be on things other than swords. So you could have a flame that tongue I, ball, for example, that I liked. And the same thing with arrow ammo of yeah. slang or ammunition of slang. Like, <laughs> you know, what that's, that's just a thing players and P uh, DMs have been doing for years now. It's like, all right, might yeah, as well just... I mean, yes, sure. Absolutely. You know what I think is really funny about the flame tongue example he gave, though? Mm. I literally did not know that flame tongue technically could only be put on swords. Oh, no? No, I just ignored that. <laughs> like, I just didn't realize that was a thing. I had yeah. no clue. And then he I mentioned that. He said that, and I went and looked yeah. at Flame Tongue, and I was like, oh, hey, weird. <laughs> I think what I, I ended up using, there's a, there's a magic item that I don't know where the fuck it appears in the Ascend to Avernus campaign, but it's a magic item, and, I, and basically what it does is as a bonus action, you activate it, and it turns your... Basically, it turns whatever weapon you have into a Flame Tongue. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's like a pair of bracers or whatever, and I'm like, "Oh, that's sick." And that's basically ended. Anytime my players basic wanted a flame tongue or whatever, I just kind of ended up doing that. Like, there you go. Just this, this item turns your weapon to a flame tongue. It, yeah. You know. It technically says any sword. Yeah. I just ignored that apparently because I just <laughs> forgot that was a thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot but, of people you know, did that. A lot of people. That being that said, shit. I mean, it, them officially broadening it, broadening that rule is fine. You know, nothing lost, yeah. nothing lost, nothing gained per se. Mm -hmm. And then the pricing came up. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. Did you find his response a little odd here? A little, um, little dodgy, little evasive. So, well, no. So, so this was my big thing because, like, you know, we we've, we've been doing the pricing with the Vecna campaign kind of deal. Well, we've been doing the, technically we've been doing the roll rolling the roll. It. Yeah, that's what I think. He, so there are a gauge price point of magic items. There's not a definite like uh, a so, flame tongue is 5000 gold pieces. There's no like definitive heat. I thought like, yeah, that's why it's like kind of weird where it's just like, yeah, they've always had like prices like, ah. 
well, so what he said was they've always had prices, um, but you could only figure them out by divining them. And I couldn't tell if he meant like using a divination spell in game or divining as in saying, oh, you could like backwards engineer the game to uh, to figure out how much you expected them to call. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. I wasn't sure if he meant divining in like a sarcastic, like, oh, you could back engineer our game design to figure it out. Or he meant no, literally he divination was, spells. I, th- I probably was just divination spells. Yeah. I don't um, know. I have no idea. But it was weird. Yeah, which is weird. Uh, but you know what's so funny? He, so Tales of the Valiant book, they priced every single magic item. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like every single one officially. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay. That's that's kind of cool. Yes. Uh, there's a part of me that kind of likes the rolling because it's like it could be randomized. Like... You know, maybe a flame tongue is more expensive in this city than like another place. Right, but, like, but you don't need to. There's a better way to do that. Yeah. Just have, yeah, but like the flat, I, I get the flat price. Like, Here's the thing. It's fine. The better way to do that, like, oh, the flame tongue costs more in this area because lower magic or weather is is to have a set base price and then a table of modifiers that can affect mm-hmm. said price or change well, they- the valuableness of something. They do kind of had something like that. So in Xanathar's, it's when you go to buy a magic item, you roll. It's a smaller table, but it's a compli- I don't know if it's a complication or if it's a. Uh, basically, it's like you buy the item at, you know, half off normal price, 25 percent increase, 50 percent increase. No, but see, that's not that's not even that's not what I mean. What I'm saying is you give a set price and then you have a table that says, if you are in an area that is particularly m- low magic, increase mm. the price by two times. If you are in an area where magic is considered evil, increase the price by ten times. If you are okay. in an area where magic is abundant, you know, uh, multiply the price by 0.5. Like, that's what I'm okay. talking about. A table of modifiers that can affect the price based on circumstance yeah. and then have the set price. That's how you could do that. Having the random rolls doesn't doesn't invoke that feeling. Having the random rolls just makes it sound like the merchant Jim sold me a soda for five dollars, and then next tomorrow he's gonna sell it to me for ten because he fucking feels like it. You know what I mean? Like the random rolls, I right. think, serves almost no purpose. You could have it there as like an optional thing if you want to be like, oh, you're not sure you can randomly roll to gauge this or that. Sure, but I don't think there's any benefit of having the random roll be the primary method of determining what the magic item should cost. And I know yeah. it's because technically, in their opinion. Well, you shouldn't be able to buy magic items. But seeing as how 5e has gotten more and more high magic and everybody yeah. always wants to buy magic items, just let people do it because clearly that's how people are playing. Especially when right. you have campaigns like Vecna Eve of Ruin, where we're literally in the magical city of doors. <laughs> mm. You know, like if you're going to put the player characters in your own adventures in Sigil, they should be allowed to buy magic items. You know what mm. I mean? Like. Why would you make it a roll? Just give me prices. Let me go shopping. You know, uh, it, it's just silly. I just think the random rolls thing is should not be the default method. Yeah. What he said for the new book, and this is where I, I was a little like I am sad now, mm-hmm. is there were always prices, but you had to divine them. And now he's saying, but now they're a little more clear and upfront than they were. Okay. I don't think that means individual pricing for every item. I think he means there's going to be a price based on rarity, which I don't like. I They already have that, though. <laughs> no, no, they have price ranges based on rarity. Price uh, I thought they had... No, like- that's what the random rolls are. The price ranges. They have range. In the DMG, there's a range. It'll be like it costs mm-hmm. this much to about this much. That's what they that's what they had before. I don't want that (laughs) because the problem is all magic items. Yeah. So it says magic item rarity. Uncommon 100 GP, 101 GP to 500 GP rare 500 GP to 5000 GP, which is a huge range, by the way. Very rare. Yeah. 5000 GP to 50,000 GP. Yeah. And then legendary 50,000 plus. Just 50,000 plus. So, no, that's not pricing. That's a price range. Get this shit out of here. Unfortunately, I think what he was based on the way Chris Perkins almost. 
it almost seemed like he dodged the question a little bit, which makes me feel like, oh no, they're just going to give us pricing based on rarity. And the reason this is a problem is because, as you know, Matt, not all magic items within the same rarity are created equal. No. Like, you can no, have... which I'm, I'm very annoyed and worried about. Because uh, there are certain things they didn't address in the player's handbook that I definitely know they are not going to address in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Yeah, like... he's in the treasure now. So, like, for example... Uh, what is it? Ring of Protection, right? Yeah. So, Ring of Protection is an uncommon magic item. Yep. But it's way more valuable than, say, a Ring of Jumping, which is also an uncommon magic item. Because a yeah. ring of protection raises your AC, and raising your AC by even a single point in D in five E is crazy. Is good. a huge deal because a the way the math works out, a single point of AC is a big deal, and b the game is so com is so combat focused that increasing your uh, likeliness to not get hit is mm -hmm. really important and super helpful. Yeah. And with cloak of displacement being a rare item, yeah. <laughs> Oh, like, yeah, disadvantage on all attack rules. And it's like, how the fuck? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, oh, hold on. Is a ring of protection actually technically rare? Hold on. Is it? Um, oh, I oh. think we keep mixing this up. One of them, I think ring the Ring of protection is, is rare. The cloak is. Cloak is, the cloak is the one. And yes. the cloak is, I think it's, all, it does, does the cloak give you saving throws as well or no? They both do the same thing. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, no, I guess because I can just hide the, the ring in my ass and just like I could yeah, still yeah. be a So yeah, the it, cloak so of protection. Like, that's right. The cloak of protection is uncommon. That's what I was trying to say. Cloak of mm -hmm. protection is uncommon. Plus one AC to saving throws and uh, a yeah, plus one to AC and saving throws. But then, yeah, the ring of protection literally does the exact mm -hmm. same thing, but is rare. Which is weird because they don't do the he like the slot method. They don't do like the slots, I have yeah. like a hand slot no, and an yeah. arm slot. Like, so not only What's the point. <laughs> so not only are magic items within their own category not created equal, magic items between categories don't even make any goddamn sense. So long story short, pricing based on category, I so so deeply hope that is not what they do because I fucking stop it. <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, I think that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Probably. And then they said they're going to revisit, 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 what? Revisiting. Revisiting. Revisit. Revisit. The magic item crafting rules. Uh, oh, it's rewind time. Huh? I, uh, I don't have high hopes on that one. I'm going to be honest. Uh, yeah. I hope. I think we're, I hope I think it's we, better. We, yeah. I mean, we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, yeah. I thought my my original thought was they were just going to take the Xanathar rules and just slap it in here, but maybe they'll refine them. If they do, if them. they do the Xanathar, let's put it this way, Matt. If you're right and they okay. do the Xanathar rules just as is, I'm going to be so mad. Well, so like the only reason I'm saying I like now I'm actually recalling back. They, I, I think in the same video where Chris Perkins was like, oh yeah, we you know there's a secret chapter in the DMG. I think in that same video, they mentioned that they took some stuff from Xanathar's guide and they took some stuff from Tasha's guide and then they put it in this new DMG and updated some stuff. So that's why that's where my head's at, where it's like, well, we have rules already. People have been using them forever. They might just be updating those or they might not and just say, fuck you. I don't know. Well, I'm, yes, I'm, but I'm not Wizard of the Coast. Saying they took something from another book doesn't necessarily mean they just took it as is and, and didn't change it, right? They could take it right. and still update it. Uh, yeah. If they, they just they take it a whole cloth, I'm going to be real tight. <laughs> right, that's that's where I'm like, it wouldn't put it past me if not, they I hope didn't not. change it. But if they update it and, or revise it in some way, refined it, I, you know, I'm happy. But there's a, there's, there's a part of my, the back of my mind where I'm like, yeah, they're probably just not going to do much to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, briefly after that, uh, they mentioned uh, again, they're harping on the multiverse being the default setting of D&D. Uh huh. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. You, you okay? Sorry, my brain was dying. My my brain was dying every time someone says multiverse. The word multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. And they they they're backing up 
this uh, this being the default setting by having a chapter about the planes and the worlds of D&D. So okay. they're telling you, yes, it's a default chapter. And here's some information on those very uh, default chapter default setting. And here's some information on all those various things. Wait, but why is it in the back of the book? That's so crazy. It should be the second chapter. <laughs> no, you know, I don't think it should, actually. I think, I think the back makes more sense. Well, Josh, I shouldn't learn how to play the game until chapter eight. I have to learn um, about the Feywild and the Shadowfell first. Nah, I don't, I don't think you need to know about the Feywild. I don't think it's that important, actually. <laughs> I think you're good. Um, no, that's, that, that, that's good. That's in the back of the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. They have a, and then they mention they have a little new small tool they call tracking sheets. Yeah. These are just fancy note taking stuff. Um, Yeah. Fancy blank note. Yeah. Some art. I don't personally give a shit about those, but some people will probably like them. Uh, I backed the Kickstarter for the Secret Art of Game Mastery uh, by Lair DM. And basically they had like a similar thing where it's like one of the books you can buy or pre-order is like just a blank book of like sheets like this, like campaign trackers, adventure trackers, yeah, no, and like nice notebook. <laughs> Fancy notebook. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like, all right, if you don't have like a, if you want to like, how much more organized is this compared to just getting like a binder or uh, a, a I think, document? I, I think guess. some, I some people, uh, when they use stuff like this, where it's aesthetic and designed, they, yeah. they are more likely to take notes think is Maybe. what it is like they're more willing to because i know in some of the newer adventures they had the campaign tracker like the uh, the one in wild beyond the witch light which is cool but uh, i don't know i how did many not see that so i'll that. have to take your word for it <laughs> yeah I, and actually i don't even remember if that's like a if that's a player facing thing or is that specifically a thing the gm is supposed to <laughs> i have no <laughs> like idea update yeah i don't remember it's been like a hot minute but i have no idea yeah and then at the end of the video, they talk about chapters one, two, and three. <laughs> no. They uh, they did what they did with the old DMG. <laughs> they talked about the more important shit at the back. Um, mm. uh, so yes, the first chapter, basically chapters one, two, and three are, as we've been saying multiple times, way more new DM focused. Like that's the whole vibe. And yeah. uh, they... Uh, chapter one is literally called The Basics. Um, chapter two is called running the game. Um, you know, sure. Fine. The one thing I will say that's kind of notable about chapter two is they do mention that this chapter talks about combat interaction and exploration and James Wyatt. Basically every time James Wyatt's on screen, I'm intrigued. It seems to be the trend. Um, James Wyatt mentions that they have rules and like uh, guidance on running exploration. And he even says there's some rules in there about how to address running a long journey. That's, uh, which that's, is really cool. Be seeing as how that's a pretty, you know, under yeah. underrepresented aspect of the game in general. Yeah, there. Um, I'm blanking on the book because I bought the PDF for it, but there's a whole book uh, that took the rules for travel from the Lord of the Rings 5e game, uh-huh. which was extremely cool for like making travel interesting and fun in a campaign and not a fucking slog or we just ah, we just skip it. And then you get to the you get to the adventure now. Right, right. Um, I, I, I'll remind I'll remind myself later at some point. But yeah, there have been so many people who have been trying to do this and make like like it's a good example now of like Wizards actually trying to be like, hey, let us te- let us show you how to do this. Let us the, the the holders of the game like finally show you how to make exploration fun and interesting. Yes, I'm 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 hoping for some promising bits in that section. Yeah. Uh, we'll see actual travel mechanics. But I, yeah. I I don't know how mechanically it might just be a lot of suggestions. But I'm still hoping for you know something. Mm-hmm. You know who knows exactly what form it will take. Uh, and then chapter three is the toolbox chapter, which is basically going to be the chapter where you deal with all that miscellaneous shit that you don't normally. You don't necessarily think about all the time, but you need to know when it comes up. Uh, Chris Perkins does mention the old 2014 DMG did have this information, but it was kind of scattered across the entire book in like somewhat random places. 
Oh. Uh, so now it's being condensed into one chapter. Um, examples nice. he gives is like traps, poisons, siege engines, NPC mm. building, that kind of stuff. Okay. Stuff yeah, that's, that's like not stuff that's more moment to moment and not as big picture yeah. stuff. And it's being all condensed into this one chapter. Again, some of that they had newer ones in Tasha's and that's where I'm yes. kind of like, yeah, I'm like, oh, they might just slap that in. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. Uh, look, slapping some stuff in from Tasha's is not a problem inherently. Uh, it's just, you know, because there is a lot of good, like the magical phenomenons and stuff in Tasha's are cool. Uh, oh, yeah. So there is good shit in there. It's just a question of was the thing in Tasha's good? Then yes, putting it into the GMG is fine. Did everyone think it was not very good? Then perhaps you should revisit it. Mm-hmm. Um, I found the book, by the way. It's uh, okay. Uncharted Journeys by Cubicle 7. Is this one you've used or just one you've heard of? Uh, no, I, so I have the PDF. I haven't used it because, uh, you know, Magic School campaign, there's really no point in long distance traveling. <laughs> uh-huh. I haven't uh-huh. used it. I might use some of these in Eberron. Uh-huh. Okay. But yeah, it sets up like, you know, how to explore, you know, uh, different class like roles and like journeying rules and preparing and all that yes, encounters. Pretty cool. Um, I, uh, I'm really hoping that this, uh, toolbox chapter is going to have, you know, those like optional rules that were in the DMs workshop chapter in the old DMG. Yeah. Like I'm hoping stuff. we get a revisit of those. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hoping chapter three has some of that stuff. Some of that weird optional rule stuff, because some of them sucked ass, but some of them were interesting and some of them like, some of them felt like an idea that could be really, really cool if it just had a little more time in the oven. And this is quite literally, you know, the DMG having more time in the oven. Like, that is the whole point of this whole oh, situation. Yeah. So I'm hoping yeah. that we do something a little a little swanky, a little, a little interesting there. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll probably be disappointed a little bit, uh, but that's okay. Yeah, because I'm, I'm even, like, going through the few options we have here now it's like creating spells creating monsters and like uh i mean i, I mean i do like the creating monster tables they have but like so those those are foes are way way better like book for that kind of stuff i mean I, it's funny you just gave the two examples i kind of don't care about <laughs> yeah i'm talking about shit like the uh let's see if i can ask of course no like the side initiative or side what? initiative yeah um the gritty realism rules the option mm, hero to points hero points honor score all that shit uh, the honor and saving yeah, yeah. score are not very good but you know <laughs> but yeah, yeah those, yeah, those yeah. sorts of things the mm. um what was the one there was one that i the that actually the healing rules the like healing food. rules yeah. are fun um, rest variants <laughs> There was one I did. At, oh, the fucking the firearms were all in this section too. Although those were oh in, yeah, those are in the players' handbook. Firearms were in here. Yeah, now they're in the players' handbook. Yes, yeah. the plot points, the futuristic weapons were in here. Like that stuff, I think is all potential has potential, and I'm kind of hoping that they revisit a bunch of those. I wonder if they're going to put the alien technology stuff in the treasure as like. As just like a magic item you can I, find. Like, I like hey, suppose. if you're doing the spaceship adventure or if you want to add alien shit to your world, like like you do in Fallout, like, here you go. Just do that. Add these guns, laser guns. I, I suppose they could do that. Or if you want to add them to your game. <laughs> like, I yeah, I don't, I don't know if they will, but I guess that's an option. Yeah. Mm. I guess I don't. I, I didn't even yeah. consider that, but I suppose that is an option. Yeah, because my like uh, my my thinking is because they took the firearms out. Exp- I don't remember if they added bombs and gunpowder into the player's, player's handbook. handbook. I don't no. think they. Uh, yeah, so that's probably gonna. Er, wait, maybe. Hold on. I don't. They might I don't remember actually. if. Hold on. I might, um, I might be a filthy liar. Oh, I think or not grenades, but like something similar, like explode hand explosives. Now in the new book. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So that's all our weapon. Uh, ba, 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 ba. yeah. Okay, that's armor. 
Uh, let's see. Bip, uh, I don't see a bomb. Or powder in here somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, because I, I well, I think they took gunpowder out from firearms in fifth edition now, and it's I just mean, like you just need the ammo. They technically never powder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Doesn't look like they did bring any of that back. Weird. That is a little unfortunate. Never mind. Gunpowder is just basically a grenade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I would. Yeah. I would have liked seeing some of those come back. Hmm. Yeah. That would have been cool. Ah, uh, who knows? Yeah. Maybe they'll bring them into. DMG book to electric. Oh <laughs> God. Or as I want to call it, um, Tosh, Tasha stars, cauldron of books. Yeah. No, we need a new, uh, we need a new D and D character. They haven't brought, brought up yet. Dritzed um, cloak of many stuffs. Yeah. Nailed it. Darian's bag, hidden pocket of many. Ooh. Oh, Starian's hidden pocket? Mm-hmm. It does have the most delicious. Matt, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Fucking chart. <laughs> no. No, stop. Get some help. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that to me on the day of my daughter's <laughs> wedding. Listen, the chart says he does. I, I, I know I what the chart the says. Stop bringing up the chart. I don't want to talk about the chart. <laughs> Butthole chart is very important. It's going to be on the uh, top. I hate that chart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes. The uh, chapter three was the last thing they talked about the video. And the sort of closing line is they said, we took good stuff from the old DMG, added in some new stuff that was lacking, and reorganized the whole thing so it's more user friendly. That was the sort of overarching objective. Yeah. We will see how much that holds up. I mean, user friendly, I think it is going to, I think that part gonna, yeah. is definitely going to be the case. There are a lot of stuff from the new player handbook that I really do enjoy, like looking through. I think stuff, organizationally, like the, way- the new player's handbook is, is quite oh, yeah. good. A lot of the art they use for like showing examples of like, uh, the different like class symbols or like the, uh, alignment, like that little picture where they have the display oh, the the beast and yeah. the amp, get yeah, a box. Like, I'm like, Oh, that's a cool way to show that. I, I think, think yeah, I think I it's think, just I think it's it, it's just laid out better. I think I think it's just yeah. ordered out oh, better. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very funny that they were like, "This is the first player's handbook that teaches you how to play the game before character creation." I'm like, "Yeah." Like, oops. I don't understand why more people don't do that. That's a weird thing. I've always thought was I don't know. I've always been team teach me how to play the game before character creation. That's always been my opinion on it. But I guess that's like a hot debate. Some people yeah, don't agree I, with that. I don't know. I'm trying to remember like my first like way 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 back the first experience was just building a character with joe which was my rogue guy and then getting into the game with the character because i guess their mindset is you can't play the game and learn how to play the game if you don't have a character to play the game well you can't but, play without a character but you can the book can teach you how yeah. the basic mechanics works because right. my thing is if I don't know how the basic mechanics are working, like work, I can't really make an informed choice. I can't make informed choices about my character without knowing how the basics work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm you, sh- like you say to me, like, oh, the rogue's primary st- attack, their uh, primary feature is sneak attack, where he gets extra damage when he attacks an, uh, an enemy. And I'm like, okay, but I don't know how damage works. I don't know how attack mm-hmm. rolls works. I don't know if that's useful or not. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's that's always been how I feel that, but I yeah, yeah. it's a hot debate apparently because some people vehemently are say no no you should do character creation first. Ah, I, I don't. Know. But the five E teams on my side because they put how to play first in the new book. Mm-hmm. So I'm right is what I'm saying. That, that's okay. what, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> and everyone else is wrong, including Matt. I don't know. About Even that. if Matt agrees with me, he's still wrong. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, that's been us. Yeah. I, I can't believe jo- it is kind of crazy like this last year seeing Josh become more of a fifth edition fan than me or Isaiah. 
I would not well, say I'm more of a D&D fan. I don't know. <laughs> you you talk about it a lot. You're like, ooh, I like the new rules. Oh, everything. You're more excited. And it's like, oh. It's just, it's just, it's just, <laughs> it's just new toy, man. What, what is it? What do you, you say? Uh, it, it consume content until next content. Oh, yeah, you can consume next pro- product. Yeah, yeah. consume product, product until next product. Like, it, it's yeah. a new fun right. toy. Hey, <laughs> 5e still sucks balls, all right? You know, <laughs> game sucks. You say that and you bought the fucking legendary or the not legendary, the special edition. Whoa, of the whoa, 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 pause. <laughs> Don't make it sound like I bought the alt cover. That that doesn't mean the alt cover is not more expensive. It's not like it. if it was more expensive, I probably wouldn't have. See, that one I was surprised when I heard that. But that that is cool that they didn't. Up, well, they because didn't you can only price. get the alt cover at game stores. Right. So it's not that it's more price. It's that they're harder to find. Mm. Uh, but anyway. Anything you'd like to say to the people, Matt, on your valiant return? Um, no, not really. Uh, new DMG looking good. Thumbs up. Uh, we shall see. Hopefully they don't send the Pinkertons after anybody who gets an early copy this time. You know, or, uh, yeah. or tells everybody they have to take down their video or sends a copyright yeah, take strike down vi- or any of those yeah. things. So far, uh, I'm not going to lie, 20, 2024 is not looking as bad as 2023 for Wizards of the Coast, but uh, it's it's not looking as good as it could could have been. <laughs> uh-huh. I love, again, I love this game, uh, but Wizards of the Coast, they are literally the embodiment of that bicycle meme of the yes. kids sticking yes, the stick in the bike and Correct. flipping it over. It's like, guys, you're always fumbling the ball, no matter what can we have one w no i'm asking no (laughs) stop fucking it no Uh, now now and i was i was like i was super happy with isaiah when like the president uh the i forgot what his name is where he was like yeah he's like you know the asian setting he's like that everyone like thinks is racist well i don't care we're gonna put it in the new forgotten realms campaign setting and you better like it i'm like wow i'm like okay that's kind of interesting i wonder how they're like they're gonna take that and then was it two weeks ago he's like yeah everyone i know uses ai AI for everything he's like i play in game a game with 30 people and each of them use ai for everything from story generations like art and characters and i'm just like Uh, it honestly bro so much cap on that statement so much first of all you play with 30 to 40 people a week i don't holy shit dude i don't believe you like, like, so you're either playing in a game a night with five yeah, to six yes. different people every night. Yes. Or you're playing or three you, times a week with 10 people or like, or like, yeah, or you're what? just lying or you're or just, you're just lying, fucking, which I think is more likely. <laughs> yeah. I can say and Valley also Bros. Just <laughs> all of those 30 to 40 people. <laughs> yeah. You say I, use I somehow don't one. believe that somehow every, don't believe you. But yeah, I um, if anyone is interested, I'd recommend watching the Sly Flourish uh, Lazy Dungeon Master show. He recently talked about like AI and everything and like it is it really more convenient to use AI to make a random random table of adventures or isn't it more creative and fulfilling as a DM to like go and find these tables yourself and like mix and match and like maybe come up with ideas yourself from looking at the tables instead of getting AI to borp out some fucking process nonsense no 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 matt see you misunderstand the point of DD is to not be creative it's just to consume product ah crazy i guess uh, here i thought i was just eating math rocks for nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no good to know it's a purpose <laughs> yeah no, see you misunderstand the objective it's not to you're not supposed to feel fulfilled when you play D. Uh, it's like doing math or something yeah i am i am and i don't know maybe, maybe later on we can talk about monster manual i am I'm very excited for the Dungeon Master's Guide. I'm very worried about the Monster Manual, but I'm not we, worried. We shall see. I'm not worried about the Monster Manual, but I think that the Monster Manual might end up being the most disappointing. Yeah. And not necessarily. I don't think they're going to fuck it up. I think they just might not do anything like I think it'll be boring is probably a better way to put it. I don't yeah. think it's going to be that interesting. That's what I, I think. Boring about. and like not for me, like looking at some of the stat blocks that they released so far, like the new mage looks OK. I'm not a fan of the new dragon. Uh, the Kuto is OK. But like, again, it, it's going to be hit or miss. 
in seeing what is what comes I, out. I'm, and I'm, I am, not, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole of the dragon thing because me and I already had a 25 minute argument about that one. So yeah, I remember. I remember listening. <laughs> so we just. I, I don't know how you listen to it. That episode's the one that's coming out. It's not- Wait, didn't you guys talk about? Oh no, sorry. I'm mixing up no. the dragon art. I think that's what I'm mixing. That up. was that a different. Episode. Yes, that was. That different. was a different child. Yeah, my no, bad. My we, bad. I also had an argument about the stat block itself. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm mixed on the stat block, but uh, that is neither here nor there. Correct. Also, we have no more time to argue. Yeah. But remember, kids. Even if Matt agrees with me, he's wrong. I fucking guess. What? Oh, no, wait, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now we're... Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>